Hey, Richard, thank you so much for being here today. We're super excited we get to interview you. I would love if you could introduce yourself. Okay, I'm Richard Friesen. I'm a science fiction and fantasy author with, I believe, 13 fiction books out and always writing new stuff. I just tell stories. That's what I love to do. And so I tell all kinds of stories. Even when we're just talking like this, I'll probably tell you some stories. So that's how it goes. Amazing. I would love if you could tell us what your books are about. Okay. Um, I have, ooh, the most popular one I have is, is a space opera where the um, we have a set of twin sisters but they're freezer twins. So one is 30 years younger than the other one. And basically it's a space opera. And the first one is a pilot and goes off on a mission to hunt interstellar pirates and figures out she's bait. And then through the process of that whole thing and what happens after that becomes kind of a legend. And then her 30 year younger sister has to figure out how to follow up a legend and be the twin sister of a legend. And so it's a space opera, lots of you know space battles and flying around and new planets and that sort of thing. So that's the first set. There are six books in that. And well, by the time this, this um, comes out, there will be a seventh, well, a seventh one in the same universe. And then I have the easiest one to explain, which is a comedic superhero named Narcolepsy. His power is falling asleep and he takes you into his dreams with him, whether you want to go or not. And everybody gets into his dreams, you know, the, the EMTs and the police officers and the bad guys and the good guys, everybody. And there are two books there. Hopefully someday there'll be more than that. And then I have um, the new book, Wetware Wizards, which right now is just a single book. It's uh, about a group of people who are rebelling against AIs taking over the country. And uh, it's kind of topical right now with all the AI stuff going on. So it, it's out there, it's called Wetware Wizards and you can find it on Amazon. And then I have a fantasy series, a four book epic fantasy series that um, it's called the Dreaming King Saga. And this is one where the king is chosen by whoever has the prophetic dream in the tower on Midwinter's day. And so the prince who thinks he's gonna be a scholar ends up being king and kind of surprises everybody. And then he, you know, steals his brother's betrothed and ticks off the ambassador from the empire. And that's just, you know, the first week. So then things get complicated. So that's what I've got going right now and lots more on the way. So love that. What inspired you to write your books? <laughs> that's a really good question. Um, each individual book or writing in general? Whichever way you'd like to go. In general, I remember way back, you know, like when I was a teenager, I was just daydreaming and I, came up with something in my head that was I made something up. I was like, wait a minute, if I can do that, I can do like real stuff. So I started writing stories and they were awful. Of course, it took a long time before I learned how to write anything anybody would want to read, but you know, get there eventually. And uh, I, uh, so, you know, each individual story comes with, with um, more than one, usually more than one, um, inspiration more than one thing the uh, space opera series interestingly I had an idea for a story in some ways it's the story I'm writing now which is three books out from where where I am and uh, the story I'm writing now was I had this idea for a story and I wanted to flesh out the universe so I went and I had, I was playing um, basically like Dungeons and Dragons back then. And I created a campaign that was space opera. And it turned out the stuff in the space opera campaign was more interesting than the original story. So that's where the inspiration came from it. And it took 
again, it took a long time, a couple, three decades to figure out how to write the story and make it worth reading. Um, I've learned a lot. Interestingly, the Dreaming King saga, doing that first novel in the Dreaming King saga, something about that changed how my writing abilities and, and how well I was writing. And I often look at stuff that I wrote before that and go, oh, this is bad. And, you know, um, but the stories are still good. So sometimes I'm going back and taking stories from that I thought of, you know, 30 years ago and writing them completely new. So, you know, you almost couldn't tell it was the same story, but um, it, it, yeah. And then I've had lots of good advice from editors and other authors and different things like that. So that I can get better at my story. So that's the, that's where it all came from, kind of. Love that. When you were writing your books, who were you thinking of when it comes to who your books are for? <laughs> you know, it's almost like people like me. <laughs> but, but um, you know, they're mostly adults. And there's kind of a weird thing where, where in a couple of my stories, the space opera for sure, starts out with um, the main character is... 15, I think, when she, when she starts, maybe 16, I forget now. Um, and so it kind of reads a little like a um, YA novel, um, but it isn't. By the time you get to the second, third, fourth book, it's like, oh, yeah, this is for grownups. <laughs> so uh, it, it isn't YA stuff. Um, I like to talk about the, 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 the Dreaming King saga. It's like in four books, it's got like three and a half sex scenes so so you know it's it's again it's 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 grown up topics um so i am writing for adults not not ya or or you know kids or anything like that now the narcolepsy stuff well there are how would you just that's one of those things they, they put on on the movies sexual situations not necessarily actual sex going on although the very first scene is um when he falls asleep while he's in bed with his girlfriend <laughs> of the very first scene of the very first book. So, you know, it, it does have that sort of thing in it. The uh, space opera series is, could be for, could be for a younger audience. I've kept the sex stuff off scene, off stage primarily. It gets talked about a little bit, but it's pretty much off stage. So depends on, you know, what, parents are okay with their kids reading and you know in some ways man I won't, I won't say that probably <laughs> but I know with our kids we my wife had the thing if if they can ask the question we're going to give them the answer and that was all fine and good until who was it that there was a song called menage a trois and they asked what that was and uh, we told them and they said ooh. <laughs> So that was that was kind of funny, but they asked, so they got the answer. Um, you know, so whatever you, whatever is good with your kids, it's it's uh, the space opera is probably for the for the youngest audience out of the out of the bunch. So amazing! How long have you been writing, and what made you really sit down and start? <laughs> I've been writing since I was. I was trying to think. I think I started in college. And um, I, uh, so 40 years and, and nothing any good for the first, first 30 of that. <laughs> so I remember there's a story coming out or it will be out by the time this comes out um, called The Sorcerer King that I wrote the first version of while I was in college. I got inspired. It was crazy. I wrote, hand wrote, mind you, hand wrote. 100,000 words in two weeks. It was insane. While I was taking classes, um, my hand was tired when I got done. And I went back and I read the read that, what I'd written back then. And I said, man, that's a good story. Man, the writing sucks. So it just, you know, there, it, there wasn't a salvageable word except maybe the main character's name. That was about it. Um, everything else had to go. And uh, it took me a while to figure out how to 
there were some things in there that were not very um they were insensitive to different groups of people and i took those out in the original that was that way the new one it is not so i've you know learning a lot about by listening to people um and finally you know you know it takes a couple of decades to sink into my brain but um listening to people and understanding what they're saying. And I finally figured that one out and said, yeah, I can't write this this way. We'll do something different. So I did. And that one, like I said, that one, hopefully it has already come out before the end of 2023 by the time this gets broadcast. So that's the plan. Two more books yet in 2023. So. Love it. What is your schedule like when you are writing a book? Well, I have a day job. So pretty much I write in the evenings. Um, I am a little looser than a lot of authors in terms of, of setting a schedule or necessarily having a goal for how many words I'm going to write in a day. Um, the thing I'd say to young authors is figure out what works for you. Um, I know all kinds of people about how they do stuff. And um, in fact, I was talking to a guy recently about being a pantser. I'm a seat of the pants writer. I sit down and start writing. I know where the ending is and I know what the characters are. And some of the real joy for me is discovering things, things that surprise me in the story. I didn't know that was going to happen. So it was kind of cool. Um, and, but that's me. Um, I know I was talking to a writer recently who is doing some work for Hollywood. And one of the things about working for Hollywood or television is you really can't be a pantser. You have to have an outline. You have to tell them what you're going to write. You have to go in and broaden the outline into a treatment and then write what you said you were going to write um, because they don't want to pay, you know, Ten million dollars, not to the author, but to make the show without knowing what they're getting, right? So you have to be able to tell them what you're getting if you're going to work in Hollywood. So, you know, it 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 runs the gamut. And like I said, I'm a pantser. I know what know what I'm doing, know where I'm going, but not how I'm going to get there. The thing I had to learn, and the thing that a young pantser has trouble with, is meandering and I kind of learned that by doing a couple decades worth of short stories that was a, a weird thing so I, I'd written some long stuff and then you know back then how you got into writing was you sold short stories to some of the magazines and then after you got a little bit of a name for yourself you could go to an agent or one of the big publishers and say hey I got a novel here and and they buy it that isn't how it works anymore um, so I, I, after writing all those short stories, most of which aren't very good, um, I wrote the Tower of Dreams, the first book in the, in the Dreaming King saga. And so it's like something, when I went back to writing novels after writing short stories for a couple of decades, I um, learned how not to meander. I learned how to stay on focus do what I needed to do and tell the story and what parts of the story I needed to tell and what parts I didn't. Um, that's, that's an important thing. If you're, if you're a seat of the pants writer, you know, if you're an outliner, that isn't a problem because you got an outline, you follow that one. Right. Um, you know, I know one writer, um, Connie Willis, she's a fantasy and science fiction writer. Um, won a lot of Hugo's nebulous. Um, and, she talked about her writing process and I kind of went, say what? It was, she goes through and she writes the dialogue and she goes back through and she writes the stage direction. Then she goes back through and she writes, I think she said, I think there are four passes. I forget what one of them was um, make sure that the reader has the information they need in this scene and that sort of thing. So she's making four passes at every single scene. And I, I could not do that. I mean, I do go back and fix things, but, but, um, I, you know, I don't write to an outline. In fact, I tried that once 
I made a detailed outline of a story and then had no interest in writing the story. So what are you going to do? So. Amazing. What do you need in your writing space to help you stay focused? Well, you know, I know a lot of people use music and I really don't. Um, interestingly, partly that's because what I'm really into in music, what I really like in music is stories. Man, go figure. <laughs> so I like I like a song that tells a story. And if there's a song that's telling a story while I'm trying to write, then I'm listening to the story, right? So that doesn't work. I probably could do classical music, but I usually don't. Um, mostly I just take my laptop and usually even sit it on my lap and just write, you know, in the evening after supper and and uh, get done what I can get done for the day. And, and that's about it. Um, I will admit, if I go, sometimes it's whole, all changed, you know, with COVID and the before times. And um, I was going into work, right? And I would take my writing laptop with me. And then at lunch, I'd go to a restaurant and write while I ate. And I could often get more done there than I would at home in the evenings because fewer distractions, right? Nobody knows me. I'm just sitting there. Nothing's happening except eating and writing. And I could get quite a bit done that way. Um, but I haven't done that as a, um, other than those lunches, I haven't done that on a regular basis just because, well, I don't know. I'm at home. I go somewhere, but you know, and if, if I retire from my day job, which I'm hoping to do in a couple of years here, then, then I may do that. I may go someplace else to write, but we'll have to see how all that works out. What I'm hoping is I can quit my day job and get, devote more time to writing so I can get more stuff out. Yeah. It, it's, it's been strange. I have gotten, the actual first draft takes less calendar time than getting comments from beta readers and the developmental editor and the copy editor and incorporating all that stuff and getting all and getting cover built and all that stuff takes more time than actually writing the first draft did. So it's, it's kind of surprising to me that that's the case, but it is. And so I am currently... I have, well, right now I have two, one novella and one novel finished, ready to go. One of them's ready to go to the copy editor. The other one's ready to go to the developmental editor and the beta readers. And I have another novella. I'm most of the way finished also in the space opera universe and a, um, a novel in my Sorcerer King universe that I'm about maybe halfway through, probably not. So, you know, I'm that far ahead. And you, you wouldn't think that with an independent publisher like me, that being that far ahead was something that would happen. But there it is. I'm, I'm that far ahead and, and waiting. I have manuscripts waiting to be published. So, you know, in some ways that's good. Um, it's better to have a continual stream of things in the pipeline than it is to have be waiting on stuff. So, so. Amazing. What is your favorite writing snack or drink? Hmm. <laughs> I'm a Dr. Pepper guy, which I really shouldn't drink. It's not very good for you. Um, but, but yeah, uh, that's, that's mostly what I do. And, and I've been trying to do better on the snacks, a little more healthy. So I've got, um, I get like raisins or craisins or something like that. And, and I eat those, which is better than, you know, M&Ms or something. So, yeah. Love it. What type of books do you personally enjoy reading? Well, um, pretty much the kind of stuff I write, f fantasy and science fiction. And um, the, it's an interesting thing I'm discovering. See, 15 years ago, maybe 20, when you would go 
to a store like Barnes and Noble and browse the shelves to find a book. And that's how you found a book that in those days, the audience would, you know, if you had an audience that liked science fiction, they pretty much also liked fantasy and they would read anything, any different genre you wrote. It's turning out these days where people are going online and searching by categories that they don't tend to do that. They stick with the categories they know. And so people who read science fiction now tend not to read fantasy. So it's, it's a different audience, which is tricky. And I'm writing more in my space opera universe than I thought I was going to write because it's selling better than any of the other stuff I've got. So um, we'll see how that goes, but, but it's, um, I like to read all that stuff. I, I guess you I guess it's speculative fish, fiction is what they call it. Um, you know, so I read Tolkien and I read Asimov and all those guys and Heinlein and, and Lois McMaster, Bujold and Connie Willis and, and all those kinds of people back in the day and whatever, you know, Anne McCaffrey, Dragon Riders of Pern. I can, I can talk about her. I could, yeah, but they won't. Um, <laughs> not, not anything personal. It's a, it's a writing comment, but, but um, the, uh, the, you know, reading all those kinds of books um, all the time and even and fairly recently been listening to them, you know, in the, in the car on audio books. Um, but it's, it's, uh, yeah, that's what I like to read. So that's what I write. And hopefully I get people that start looking at my name rather than, than, you know, space opera to find my work. So I guess we'll find out. Love it. Are there any books or authors that inspired you to become a writer? Oh, no, that's an interesting one. You know, the, the thing that started the ball rolling, I think, is in um, fifth grade, my teacher in fifth grade would read to us. And she, she read us The Hobbit. We, we would have reading time at the end of every class day and she read us The Hobbit. It was like, wow, this is really cool. So I went home and I asked my brother, what about The Lord of the Rings? Can I read that? So I started reading The Lord of the Rings. And, you know, so reading, of course, is the first, first step towards writing and understanding story and that sort of thing. So that's kind of where it started. And like I said, it was, it was teenage daydreaming that, that, I said, wait a minute, if I can, you know, just off the cuff daydream, that kind of stuff, why, why can't I just actually do it? You know, so I did. I said, it took me a long time to get any good at it, but that's what started it. Love it. What books did you grow up reading? Did you have an all time favorite? Well, like I was saying, you know, The Hobbit, The Lord of the Rings, um, or of course, Major. Um, you know, there's, wow. Um, Orson Scott Card's Ender's Game, of course. You know, the rest of the series is like, hee, hee, hee. but Ender's Game itself is just fabulous. And the Dragon Riders of Pern, the first few books of that. Yeah, that's the, the thing. The thing I say about writing and and what you choose to write and how well you write is Anne McCaffrey. So I'm picking on a grandmaster here. Understand that she's a grandmaster and she's got tons of books out, just tons and has won awards and rightfully so for the awards she won. But the Dragon Riders of Pern is a novella called We're Search that won the Nebula Award. And then she linked it into a novel. The novella is fabulous. It's just plain fabulous. The novel she extended out into is really good. And the second novel is pretty good. And the third novel is, hmm, do I want to keep reading this? But apparently a lot of people did because they're like, I don't know, 30 novels in the Pern universe now. And so there's something in there that people are loving, right? 
And it, even if the stories aren't told all that well, and, and some of it is just kind of weird and, and doesn't track and different things, people are still loving it. So you have to ask as a writer, okay, what is she doing that's making people read this? Part of it, I think, is just the dragons. I like the dragons and the dragons are, you know, they get to ride the dragons and have fun doing that. But, you know, so it, it's, it's the kind of thing you have to ask and understand that it doesn't necessarily have to be a fabulous book to sell a lot of copies, which is strange. It also goes back to, um, again, Harlan Ellison, um, you know, short story writer, par excellence from mostly 60s and 70s. Um, he wrote this story called, For I Have No Mouth and I Must Scream, right? And it is, the way he put it, he said, it is the most reprinted story in the English language. And his comment was, I ripped that off in four hours one night. <laughs> and it's just like a kind of a throwaway story. And everybody loves it. And his story he, he called Grail, where he reads it and says, wow, I had something going that day when I wrote Grail. And nobody cares. Um, we as artists do not get to choose what is good and what is not good, what our best work is and what our worst work is. The audience chooses that, not us. So it's... Uh, um, it's kind of a weird thing to think about it that way, but but we don't decide what's good and what isn't good. Um, the the writer doesn't do that. We write the best we can write, and one thing the readers will love, and the other thing the readers will hate. And what are you going to do? Write the next thing. That's about all you can do. So love it. On the other side of that, now as an adult, what are your favorite series or authors that if they come out with something, you automatically grab it? Well, there's Lois McMaster Bujold, although she isn't writing as much anymore. I think she's kind of semi-retired. I know old people. That's what I know. Um, so um, Connie Willis is another one like that. And again, she's in her mid-70s now, I think. And uh, so she's not writing nearly as much as she did either. And uh, there's a, hold on a minute. I, there's a new guy who, who knows if he'll ever come out with more than this series. Um, I always forget his name. What is his name? Anyway, that I really love. He just writes fabulous stuff and he thinks he writes terrible stuff. Um, but, you know, that's the way writers are. Well, and of course there's, the one everybody reads, which is Brandon Sanderson. Um, yeah, that whole thing where you know about the about the Kickstarter he did, right? No, <laughs> I forget. He set a goal. I forget ten million dollars or something. I got like forty million dollars on a Kickstarter. <laughs> Basically, what was happening, if you read between the lines and, and the subtext, was he was fed up with the big publishers and decided he wanted to do it himself. So basically he was raising money to effectively start a publishing company that publishes Brandon Sanderson. So with $40 million, he can hire staff and editors and people to do covers and do it all himself. And um, it's, it's the, the thing, I know an author who read the, read the, the, um, judge's opinion on the Simon & Schuster Random House acquisition, which was rejected due to um, you know, antitrust things. And the judge said, of the CEOs of those two companies, you know nothing about how publishing works. After listening to all this testimony, you thought the CEOs didn't know how publishing worked. And, and that's the kind of thing where Brandon Sanderson was rebelling against. It's like, I'm done with this. I don't want to do it anymore. And now instead of getting maybe five or 10% of his cover price of his book, he's probably going to be getting 70. So, you know, there you go. Um, yeah, there's a, there, for new writers, there's a, there's a myth 
that if you get Random House or somebody like that to buy your book, that they will do marketing for you. And that is not true. In the olden days, when when you were buying books by you know, browsing on a shelf, the big publishers could get your books on the shelf. But that's not how books are bought anymore. And we can do keywords and blurbs and covers as well as the big guys can. So they don't do marketing for you unless you're Stephen King or Dean Coons or one of those guys. They don't do marketing. And that means even if you get picked up by one of the big publishers, you're still having to do your own marketing, which is a big surprise for a lot of people, I think. So that's why there are, there are other reasons, but that's why I would recommend authors to go with either independent or with a small press somewhere. Because if you're going to have to do the publishing, the marketing yourself anyway, you might as well get a bigger cut. And both of those will give you a bigger cut. Um, what I've seen from most small publishers these days is 50%. Um, so there's the printing cost or whatever it costs to actually make the book. And you subtract that and then the, the publisher and the author split the rest. So that's the, that's the kind of thing that's going on these days. And it pays to, you know, you got to keep up on this stuff. It's not, it's not uh, easy and it changes. So it is what it is. Love marketing that. books yes what would you tell someone just starting out with reading again well one don't just look for books from big publishers there's a lot of really really good stuff out there that's independent um second i would be careful with the with you know when you're getting on amazon or any kobo or wherever you're buying your book usually you can read four or five pages and you kind of got to be like an editor and say, if I was an editor, would I buy this book with this opening? And if you wouldn't, then don't buy it. Um, you know, that's the way it is. Um, I've read, you know, I go to conventions and stuff with lots of authors and readers and things and, and, uh, Every once in a while, you know, some independent author only. Let me see it. I'll read it. And I start reading the first few pages, and 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 uh, go, yeah, no. You know, like there was one where the first line was, "The raven held the barrel to the priest's head." It's like, wait, is this a bird or a person? And what kind of barrel exactly are we talking about here? You know, and so watch for those kinds of things on independent authors. You know, they're, they're, the one thing you don't have on an ind independent is the um, gatekeeper, which is good and bad, right? You know, it used to be that the editor at the big publishing house was the gatekeeper who, if it didn't meet a certain level of quality, it didn't get published. Um, the problem was they also had a little bit, especially more recently, a little bit of the Hollywood mentality of, I don't understand how to classify this, so I'm not gonna buy it. That for instance was one of the problems they had with Princess Bride. Have you seen the Princess Bride? Yeah. It's great stuff. Hollywood didn't know what the heck it was. So it flopped in the box office and made a killing in, you know, DVDs and, you know, VHS and those sorts of things because people figure it out. Said, well, this is really cool stuff. So um, the gatekeepers would would sometimes not buy a book that was really really good that they didn't couldn't classify, right? And so there's that problem. But what it means is for an independent, if you're an author, you should be getting and paying for. It's expensive. It's not cheap. Paying for a developmental editor who can tell you yeah, this is good enough, or no, this really isn't good enough, all right? Buy a gatekeeper, hire someone to be your own gatekeeper, because, you know, if it's not a good book, you know, 
make sure your book's good. But yeah, my my biggest advice would be to read read the first few pages of the book and see what it's actually like and whether it direct, what you know pulls you in, whether everything makes sense, whether the you know the prose is clean, um, all that kind of stuff before you buy the book. And uh, you know it it is even today probably 75 per 80, to 80 percent of the sale is the cover is you're going on Amazon and what do you see first? You see the little thumbnail of the cover and that's what you click on. So if you don't have that, then you don't get people to click on it. And then, then there's the blurb after that. And if the blurb pulls them in, then they'll read the, the sample and see what they think. Um, Yeah, the thing I didn't know for a long time was there are best of in every category on Amazon, hundreds of categories. So if you're into, you know, techno spy thrillers, you can go find a list of the 100 top selling techno spy thriller, thrillers. Um, you now, obviously, there's going to be stuff that isn't on that list, but, but, you know, you can start there and and see what you like. And the other one I would say, if you, do, if you find an author, you've read a good, you know, find a good book by an author, look for, look for the author. Don't just look for, you know, like I said, space opera necessarily. Look for the author's name and find the author and see what else they've got. Because even Brandon Sanderson, I don't know if you know that, he's got, he's got a lot of fantasy stuff, but he's got some science fiction stuff out there. Uh, and I don't know how well it sells compared to the fantasy, but he's Brandon Sanderson probably quite a bit, you know, you know, the people look up his name. So it's, uh, yeah, that's what I'd say. Read, you know, I love that. on the other side of that, what would you tell intro, someone just starting to write like. their own book? Well, I mean, there's, there's lots of advice. One is finish what you write and write the whole story because no matter what, whether it's terrible or the next masterpiece that's going to sell 5 billion copies, is it won't sell any copies if it's not done, right? You can't do anything with it if it's not done. Um, it's the, the, all my references are old. You know, the Christopher Reeve Superman, remember that one? Is the only superhero book story, only superhero movie without a fight scene in it which is kind of cool, actually. <laughs> um, and I thought it was a fabulous movie right up until the last five minutes. Like, really, guys? You couldn't come up with a better ending than that? And um, the ending matters. The ending is huge. Um, there was a, a trilogy I read by Robert Silverberg where I was going through this thing, and it was it was kind of okay and, and not really... I was like, what the heck's going on? And why is, you know, why did that happen and all this stuff? And then I got to the end and then was, oh my goodness, that's wonderful. The end was brilliant and the rest of it wasn't. So the end is what people remember. So you got to have the beginning and you got to have the ending. Um, a lot of people say you spend more, more time polishing the beginning than any other part of it. The first, you know, five pages. Um, well, it depends on how long the story is. In a short story, it's the first, you know, couple paragraphs. But um, I don't, I'm not very good at writing short stories, frankly. Uh, my short length tends to be novella. I don't know if you know. You know, it's a weird thing. Writers talk in how many words it is, not pages. You know, a lot of readers would talk, it's, it's 300 pages, right? And, well, that doesn't mean anything because your type size can be bigger or smaller, right? So, so uh, short stories are technically up to 7,000 words. Novelettes are from 7,000 to about 25. And then from about 25 to 60 or 70 is a novella. And generally my short stuff, I tend to write stuff in the novella length or novel length. And that's what I write. Um, but the other one is find either beta readers who aren't your family or a writer's group, someone who can offer you constructive criticism on whether this story is working or not. The, uh, 
whatever works for you on that. There, there are drawbacks to each of those things. Um, I know um, author David Brin says when he gets his beta readers, he wants them to be mean, just plain mean to him in, in his first draft of his stories, because if they're not, somebody else will be out there. And so he has to think through the difficult stuff. And I, I like that too. Give me, give me whatever you're thinking, you know, if you're reading me as a beta reader. Um, so finish what you write. Get other people to look at it and tell you what it needs to be, how it needs to be fixed. Read books on writing craft. Stephen King has one. Ursula Le Guin has one. Um, there are dozens of them out there. Um, there's a guy, a friend of mine named Stant, S-T-A-N-T, Latore, I-L-I-T-O-R-E, um, who's written five books. And it's like how to write characters your readers won't forget, how to write worlds your readers won't forget. There's a whole series like that. And, you know, he's he's... His are interesting because he has exercises in his books. So you go along, you read a chapter. At the end of the chapter, there's an exercise. Here, write this and do this with it. And so you get to practice what you're writing. Um, there are a whole bunch of books on writing out there. And, you know, read up, figure out how to tell a story, um, what it means to have a, you know, uh, what the climax is, what the Daniel Ma is, how all that stuff works. Um, interestingly, hero's journey is something to study. Um, the original Star Wars movie was George Lucas. Someone, I think if he took a class or something and said, you know, if you write this, it will sell. And so he said, that's not true. Wrote it and it sold. Not only did it sell, it was a huge freaking hit. And they're still going on that thing because he wrote that first Star Wars movie is classic hero's journey stuff. So it's, it's, uh, it works. And, you know, a lot of people, but it's really artificial. Well, yeah, it is. Storytelling is really artificial. So it's, uh, um, write, finish what you write. Read books on writing craft and get other people to read your work and give you an honest opinion, even if it's mean, about what you're writing. Right. So those are, that's the beginning of it. There's there's more after that, but that's that's the starting point. Yeah, and you know, one of the things that that isn't apparent if you're not a writer. Ideas are a dime a dozen. There are tons of ideas. Um, I remember back in college, I would say, yeah, I'm writing this novel about this thing. And someone said, oh, I'm writing a novel too. And she said, and my reaction was, I never said it out loud. I was good. Just one, you have one idea. That's all you got. I got at least seven or eight percolating in the back of my head all the time. I can write this next story. Oh, and this other one. There's always... Dozens of ideas. They're easy to come by. Um, there was a, uh, that's never going to get published, which is a, a shame. Basically, there was an author, um, Bruce Holland Rogers, who he and his wife made this thing called the Creativity Wheel. And then they got divorced and they both owned part of it. So it's never going to happen. Um, but basically, he had, I think, 12 segments. I think they divided creativity into 12 segments and then they had an active and passive for each one and ideas were just one of the 12 um he talked about um search versus wander like if you're doing research for a story finding out what you want to write about search versus wander searches you're going to go i'm going to do a google search for um how does a flintlock rifle work right i had to do that for my sorcerer king story um versus oh look here's a link i'm gonna click on that huh what's that what's that down at the bottom hey let me look at this and just kind of wander around and randomly do stuff or you know go out go out and literally wander and see what you find and they'll you know maybe go to the library and just wander the stacks and pick up a book and say oh, that looks interesting what's that you know um that's wander versus search right and both of those are valid and both of those are part of the creative process 
And it's not just ideas. It's, it's ideas are just the beginning of it. It's like the appetizer to the whole thing. So um, there are tons of ideas out there. And in some ways you can say there are no new ideas. It's all about how we as the authors put ourselves right. into the story. You know, we're, we're, we're the unique part, not necessarily the story, right? So do with it, work from the heart, give it everything you've got. And, oh, yeah, if you do get to the place where you're, you know, sending it out for beta readers and stuff like that or editors or whatever part of the process it is, start the next thing. Don't sit around and wait for it to come back. Start the next thing. In fact, I just I just had that happen. I'm, I said three quarters more or more through the space opera novella, and one of my beta readers finally got back to me on it, and and so I had to go through the other one, and and fix some stuff that she found in there, and now it's ready to go to the copy editor. So I'm going to send it to the copy editor, and then I'm going to go back and work on the next one. So. Uh, you're always writing. Now, I, I admit, I found a, uh, so I was writing my humorous superhero narcolepsy, and I thought, you know, I've got this space opera and narcolepsy, and I'll just alternate between them. And so I'll put out one space opera, then one narcolepsy for a while here. Well, I forget which one I was working on, but I was working on, I think I was working on one of the space opera books. And a narcolepsy book came back from the editor. It just about broke my brain. Um, the space opera is first person serious stuff. And narcolepsy is third person comedy. And switching from the one to the other was just, yeah, it, it kind of broke my brain. And so I said, okay, I'm just going to do the space opera. And <laughs> we'll get back to narcolepsy some other day. Um, but, you know, so write the next thing while it's off at the editor and then, oh, the other one. And this is something, again, it's something experienced authors know. Your words aren't sacred. Just because you put it on the paper or in the, in the word processor doesn't mean it can't change. Doesn't mean you can't just, oh, that sentence is horrible. That whole scene needs to go um, get rid of stuff, put new stuff in. Um, that's that's really the, the famous Raymond Chandler quote, quote about murder your darlings is what that's about is, is he was saying, basically, you have this favorite thing that's going in your book and you wrote it and you really love it and it needs to be cut. So um, that's how, you know, Again, that's something that sometimes takes practice to figure out after you've done it a while and fixed a bunch of books then and fixed a bunch of short stories or whatever you're writing. You write them, you give them to people, you fix them, you start realizing, I can change just about anything on this, right? It doesn't have to be this way. It can be a different way. And it's all good. And those kind of things, you know, I could talk for hours on that kind of stuff. So Love it. What's one thing that people are generally surprised to find out about you? <laughs> That's a good question. Genuinely surprised. Well, I think there's one that most people probably don't even know is um, my dad and my grand his parents were all Mennonites. Uh, came over from Russia in 1870s farmers planting winter wheat and uh, so it's a it's a I actually have a short story about that that's uh, it, it it details it's an in-group culture um, and you know they uh, it, interestingly the Mennonites held together as a cohesive unit from I forget the late 1600s through to the late, well, 
middle late 90s, 1900s, right? And they were able to keep their in-group culture as farmers and bring stuff over. And it wasn't until they got here to the US that the culture started breaking down. Um, they're the original conscientious objectors. What would happen was they would be in a country, it started out in like Germany or Switzerland, no, not Switzerland, uh, Holland. And then the, the king or whoever was in charge says, you gotta be in the army. And they said, nope, we're leaving. And they would move. And they kept moving until they eventually got here. And um, then we said, no, you don't have to be in the army. And that, uh, so they stayed. And what happened was the American culture infiltrated the in-group and has basically, it's not there anymore. Um, it's all gone. In fact, where my, my grandparents' house was, there used to be probably 50 to 60 farmers out there. And now there are three. So they're gone. Um, but that's, I imagine most people find that kind of surprising. So. Love it. Is there anything you would like to say or add? Oh, I feel like I've been talking an awful lot here. Um, buy my books. They're really good. No. <laughs> um, you know, look me up on Amazon, Richard E. Friesen. And I have an author page and has all my stuff, even a few short stories. Um, and uh, yeah, I think you'll enjoy them if you read them. It's like the, like the end. So the Dreaming King Saga, it's a four book fantasy, epic fantasy. And this is a thing where I'm the author. I know what's going to happen. I get to the end of that story and I'm in tears. Every time, six or seven times in a row, right? I'm not going through this just once. And so I love it. I just love it. Um, and it's not a, it's not a um, bad ending. It's a, it's a little like, like the Lord of the Rings where it's a bittersweet ending where, you know, there's, they won, but there was a cost to winning. So, but yeah, I'm, I'm by the time I, I get through that, I'm in tears. And I, I would love to have people read that series, all four books and get to the end and say, wow, that's, that's an ending. So that's one of the ones that's out of all my books sells the least. So, you know, again, part of it is everybody's looking at the space opera. They don't find the epic fantasy. Where's the best place for readers to find your book? I know some readers love signed copies and the best place to connect with you. Okay. Um, pretty much you'll find my books on Amazon. Um, I don't know if you know about the, the Kindle, the Kindle Unlimited and how that works, where the authors get paid for every page you read on your Kindle. And I make probably 75 to 80% of my income from those page reads. Um, my income as an author, I should say. So it's pretty hard to say, oh, I'm going to go wide and put it on Kobo and Apple and Barnes and Noble and all that stuff when 70, 80, when I have to stop getting that 70 to 80% of my income for it. So um, it's on Amazon. If you have Kindle Unlimited, you can download it for free, which is always kind of nice. And um, the, uh, oh, and you can reach me if you'd like at, uh, author at richardfriesen.net and you can contact me. I don't sell books direct, but it's, uh, uh, you know, there's a really interesting thing. And, and I wonder how some authors, there's an author too, I'm wondering how they're getting around it. They recently changed the laws so that internet is no longer immune to sales tax. What that means is if someone from Dakota buys my book from me. I have to sign up for South Dakota sales tax and pay sales tax to South Dakota, right? 
and California and all 50 states. So, and it's where the person purchasing it lives, not where I live, right? So it gets really, really difficult to sell, personally sell my books. Now, if I'm at a convention or something like that, I'll sell you a book and, and I'll deal with the income tax for the, where the convention is. That's, that's not that big a deal. There are also some states that get really, really picky about it and do really annoying things with their sales tax. Uh, California is one of those. Um, so it's, um, yeah, that's something, something to watch out for if you're actually selling your books yourself on your own web page. Um, income tax, not income tax, sales tax is now a royal pain. Um, hopefully someday someone will fix that, but you know, it's, so if you sell it through Amazon or Barnes and Noble or any of those, they take care of that tax and you don't have to worry about it. So yeah, I know artists, artists, you know, actual paintings and pottery and stuff who have just an awful time selling their stuff that way because they have to pay all this sales tax in all the different states. So yeah, find it on amazon.com and uh, I'd be happy to hear from you on my email, author at richardfriesen.net. I have, a, have richardfriesen.net is my webpage too. You can, you can get in there and... Uh, I think there's even a page on there where you can give me your email address for my mailing list and download a free story. And uh, so you can find that. I'm not sure I've ever had anybody do it, but it's there. So um, I do have a newsletter. If you'd like to sign up for the newsletter, that would be wonderful. And um, heck, if you want to be a beta reader, if any of my stories sound interesting to you and you want to be a beta reader, drop me an email. I would love to have more beta readers. I, for myself, I turned out, again, when I was writing the Dreaming King saga, I was writing too fast for a writer's group to keep up with me. Um, and, you know, if I'm finishing a story in four months and it's going to take a year and a half for the writer's group to get through the whole thing, that's just too long. So I need beta readers. Um, yeah. Amazing. Well, thank you so much for being here today. We're so grateful we got to interview you. We'll be sure to drop those links and that information in the show mo- show notes. That way everyone can find you. And again, okay. thank That'll you so excellent. much. Oh, I, I also have Patreon. Um, oh. I'm on Patreon. So if you want to, you know, contribute a monthly amount, which will again, help me eventually get to the ways where I'm writing full time and then I can put more books out. Yeah, I'm going to put... In, in 2023, though, I've had three books out. And it's like, yeah, I can get more out if I'm writing full time. Um, so, you know, it's, it's, that's, that's the kind of thing Patreon is. Um, and yeah, that's the, I'm out there. I think you have to look for me. Um, Richard E. Friesen. And I'd love to hear from you. Thank you so much again. Thank you for having me. I sure appreciate it.